today we're going to talk about finding female ancestors. So here are some quick research tips. You always want to record women with their maiden name. A lot of times people will still put the names of their husbands along with it, but in most um, programs and anything you're using to search, you always want to put their maiden name because their married name can lead you to different people. If you don't know the exact dates for your ancestor, try to list your best guess based off the ages of her children. This can usually be done by guessing at least a minimum age she had to have been to have her child. And obviously she would have at least been alive until that point. And also you want to research all of her children, not just the child that you descend from. You can find so much more information from her children instead of just looking at one child. Women were typically married in the, their home county, not the grooms. If you're unable to find a record to support an event, it does not mean that that event did not occur. There could be several explanations as to why you're unable to find the record. Typically, one of the biggest is perhaps there was um, record loss in that county. A courthouse could have burned, natural disaster, um, or it could have not been recorded in the correct location. So try to learn as much about your county before you go looking for your records. We're gonna go over a quick case study. This is on Temperance Wiggengate. And this is her headstone. She has one of my favorite epitaphs, which states, remember me as you pass by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so you must be. Prepare for death and follow me. I just always kind of like that to start with. <laughs> um, but when you're starting to research your ancestor, always begin by recording what you know about them. Even if some of it might be folklore, at least record it so that you know whether or not it's true when you start your research. So you'll begin by searching for proof and this will slowly weed out that fact from fiction. Record all of your proofs and where that information came from. So many people do research and years later when they go back to show it or look for something else, they realize they don't know where those records came from. So always record where your information came from. For some ancestors, you might have conflicting proofs. So you want to try to find a reason to justify that conflict. So back to temperance. This is where we have family folklore versus fact. Um, one of the kind of biggest family folklore passed down through some of the generations, and this is um, quoting from a book that was published, it says our founding father, who would have been John Wingate, met his wife to be. She was a young Cherokee maiden. Apparently, as the story goes, he did not like her Indian name and gave her the name of Temperance. I think this is a story that is the most common myth in almost all Southern families is they have a great grandmother or so forth that was a Cherokee princess or full-blooded Cherokee. And I'd say almost 99% of the cases, this is simply folklore. There is no fact to be found about it. Um, to disprove this, Temperance is listed as the head of household in 1830 in Darlington, South Carolina. So if she had been Cherokee, she would not have been listed as a head of household in the censuses for 1830 or 1840. 1850 is about the earliest that they would have recorded Native Americans, um, but they would not have distinguished as to any particular type or tribe. It wasn't until technically 1890, but we don't have most of those census records. So about 1900 when those distinctions were made. It continued on that John died around 1830 and was buried along the trail, which would have been the Hawthorne Trail. 
and he was buried somewhere in the state of Georgia. This also does not line up with the facts that we have. Um, Temperance did not migrate to Georgia until about 1847. She had been living on her own for roughly 20 years by that point. Again, she's in 1830 and 1840, she is listed as the head of household in Darlington, South Carolina. So there's no record of her traveling prior to that. And we have other records of her in uh, South Carolina. They also stated that the place of her birth was unknown. When you look at all of the proof records, her birth location is given as North Carolina on more than four different records. And this is also confirmed by looking through all of her children and records where they stated their mother being born as well. So here's an example of the 1830 census that she's recorded on. Um, in most cases, your census records are kind of recorded in the form that they were taken, as in who they went to in that order. Unfortunately, this census taker decided to, I guess, record on something else and then compile his list on the form where he put all the names in alphabetical order. So this means that it's very difficult to tell who exactly her neighbors might have been. But as you can see, she's listed at the bottom, which you'll see a little clearer in a minute. And not far above her is uh, James Shirley. And we have records to show that she worked for the James Shirley family, um, kind of taking care of the children and the household for them. And by that point, her husband was no longer around. So she had to find a means to support herself and her children. So these are the two census records that she appears in, in Darlington, South Carolina. In 1830, she's listed as Tempe, and it's almost spelled Wingate. And whenever you find your ancestor on a record, especially the females, record that name as it is spelt on the actual record. It very well might have been a nickname. And so therefore you wanna follow up and see if that nickname stays the same, if it changes over time, if they go by their middle name more than their first or so forth. Sometimes it can have to do with where they move and the um, interpretation of an accent as to how it's spelled. So always write that name down as it's spelled in the record. By 1840, she's still in Darlington, but her name is spelt out Temperance Wingate. And even though these pre-1850 census records can be quite difficult to keep track of who's in the household, if you make a chart so that you denote how many males and females are in the household and their age groups, you're still able to follow them through the census records. Here is the 1850 census where she is finally down in Georgia. She's living with her um, son, John Wingate. And as you can see uh, right here where she's listed, the reason her last name is written a second time is there's someone else living with the family who has a different last name. Um, 1850, they did not list relationship, however. But you can see her birth location is listed as North Carolina. And also over here, she's listed as not being able to read or write. Um, in 1860, we find her in Doherty County, and she's living with a Jackson family, who we are not quite sure who this is, since they only listed initials for the first names, yet they wrote out Temperance's name altogether. So, and also in this census, you'll notice that they wrote the first name and then the last name instead of how most of the others do last name first. Um, and in this one, uh, she is about 70 years old in Doherty County. And then we have the 1880 census. This one is slightly more difficult to read. Um, but she's living with a different son, Rosier Wingate. And this is the first census that would record 
the relationship to the head of household. So it states mother right here. She's listed once again as being born in North Carolina, but you notice the tick marks over here are not listed, meaning that she could read and write. And the story about that goes that um, she helped found a church down in uh, what was Worth County at the time. And she learned to read and write, read at least the Bible um, when she was in her near 80s. So she was the first Sunday school teacher of this new church. Now I'm going to go to a quick case study on someone else, Shadrach Carter and his two wives. A lot of people have either merged these as the same individual or are completely unaware of one or the other. So uh, Pensy G. Shepherd was Shadrach Carter's first wife. There's a marriage record for them from the 6th of December, 1841 in Leon County, Florida. Until recently, this was only a marriage index. Um, I was able to finally locate a copy of the original, but it was in an unindexed digital collection, which means I had to go through all of them reading the names before I was able to find the right one. Pensy died between the end of 1850 and sometime probably in 1856. Um, her last child was born in December of 1850, and she's listed on the census record with Shadrach. Um, but he remarried Mary Freeman around 1857. Their first child is born in January of 58. So that means they would have most likely been married about that time. Some researchers have confused Mary and Pensy. Again, the reason I say always record those nicknames. Um, one researcher has tried to say that Mary is a nickname for Pensy. Um, I certainly have never come across that. There are several nicknames for Mary, but I am not familiar with Mary being a nickname. Also, the ages of the two women do not match. The reason for this confusion is because no marriage record can be found for the couple um, to provide a marriage date. We've looked in various counties, different locations. Remember I said that usually the marriage took place where the wife or bride um, was from. But in this case, we have not been able to locate that. Shadrach and Mary had 10 children together. And so some of their children's records also show that their mother was Mary Freeman, not Pensy, whereas Pensy's children also indicate that Pensy was their mother. Um, Shadrach and Mary are buried beside each other, and her headstone reads Mary Freeman wife of Shadrick, or actually Shedrick Carter. It was very rare during that time for a woman to be listed by her maiden name on her headstone, which makes that so interesting. And their headstones are contemporary to the time of their death. So these are the two um, proofs that I have for each couple. On the left is the marriage record and as you see there, it's listed uh, Shadrick Carter and Pensy G. Shepherd. And then we have the headstone for Mary Freeman, where it lists wife of Sh Shedrick Carter. His name is actually spelled several different ways on various records. Um, and so Mary was born in 1836, where uh, Pensy was born about 1821, so there was a decent age difference that was able to distinguish between the two women. These are some sources that may have more information on your female ancestors. As many of you know, in early times when a woman was married, she gave up all rights to her husband. This included nearly all of her possessions, land, money, and the ability to make decisions on their own. So due to this, you often have to research the males in their life to find more information on your female ancestor. 
This would be their husband, father, brother, or brothers, sons, and grandfathers. You can often find men who wrote their wills and they leave things to their grandchildren and will usually list the names. Clues to a woman's maiden name can often be found on records other than a marriage record. Um, a widow's pension will often list um, her maiden name and when she married her husband and the location. A child's death certificate um, will often list the mother with her maiden name if it was known by the person giving the information. Church records are always something worth looking through. An obituary might mention who her parents were so that you're able to find a maiden name. Wills, as I mentioned. Deed records from a parent or even a brother are often a good indicator. They would often say to their beloved daughter or beloved sister, or something like that, so that you know what that maiden name was. And also newspaper articles. Once you know your ancestors made a name, see if she may have lived, or excuse me, had family living near her in census records. Now, this is typically something that is very useful, but if you happen to find an enumerator who listed all of the names in alphabetical order, that might be a little bit more challenging. Um, and one thing that is actually still a common practice Often a child will have a given name that was their mother's maiden name or perhaps their grandmother's maiden name. So even if a woman um, has a child, I, I've seen some very interesting names, first or middle names that were once a last name or a surname. And again, this can carry out through generations. So that's a good indicator as well of a woman's maiden name. Try not to make assumptions as to that maiden name, however. Many times a surname from her first marriage can be mistaken as her maiden name. So always try to figure out if there's a chance she might have been married more than one time. As many of us know, when we come to our African-American female ancestors, they're sometimes the most difficult to trace. It's often more challenging to find a maiden name, especially for these individuals. If your female ancestor was enslaved, you will often have to search through various records separate from those already mentioned above. To begin with, I recommend searching the Freedmen's Bureau records. Um, there's a chance that your ancestor could have registered and given information on where she was born and who her family members were. The Freedmen's Bureau was, most people believe, just for those who were previously enslaved, but it was anyone of African descent who was trying to either open up an account, register, and it was a wonderful way to list information about themselves. You might even find information on their siblings and their children as well. You have registers of free persons of color that could give more information. Um, after emancipation, one thing that was also created by the Freedmen's Bureau were cohabitation records. And so this was a way of recording and legitimizing unions that occurred during bondage. If a major name is given for the female, it was usually the name of the slaveholder, however. So you might have to do a little bit more digging. Look for African-American published newspapers and articles. Ads would often be placed by those in search of family members. And one thing you will often need to do is once you find that quote maiden name of the female, you might need to trace and research the slaveholder's family to find more information on your enslaved female ancestor. And a lot of people think this is just a dead end for them or that's their brick wall. Sometimes it can be, but often if you will um, search through those records, you can often find information that they would have recorded on all of those who were unfortunately enslaved. 
in slave narratives, mothers were often mentioned. They were kind of one of the most prominent topics, if you will, mentioned by all individuals. And a lot of times their heritage would have been spoken about as well, where they came from. Church records are a wonderful place to look for names and the family of your ancestors. Uh, many African Americans are recorded in church histories because they help found those churches. And then, of course, the one common uh, research method for all women is that frequently you will need to trace the men in their life in order to find more information. And that's it for today. Join us next time. Thank you.